All right. We're going to talk about the cast of characters within a uh, within a data project. Who are the people that are there? Who make it work? Who get in the way? Uh, we got Rich with us. Glenn's going to be joining us here in a minute, I think. Uh, and then we've got uh, we got Troy Clemente here, and um, I've got a little uh, I've got a little sound effect uh, sound effect thing that I'm that I'm uh, playing with. Here's a whip. All right. So. <laughs> Toys. All right. Yeah, this is this is my audio toys. All right. So um, it, what I wanted to just just talk about from last week, we, we discussed, you know, what what um, what are some of the uh, things that we do for work? And then it kind of evolved into this this whole thing about how we turn data into information and that and that whole process. And it's a very sort of management oriented process to start. And then it kind of gets into the data side. And so what I want to talk about now is, you know, who are the cast of characters during that process? You know, who are the people who are standing in the way of getting it done? Um, and, and ultimately, what I want people to be able to walk away from this uh, session with is, here are the people I need to have on my project. These are the kinds of people, this is the title types that, that I need to be looking for if I need to be hiring. I want this to be the video that people go to. Um, so, all right. So, so let's just, and I'm going to, I'm going to push this to you, Rich, for when, when it comes to a data, uh, data management project, you know, who are the, oh, Glenn just joined us. I'm Welcome. Hey, he made it. Oh, no, he's taking his headphones off. Hey, there Jared, he is. You know, I mean, should we maybe start with the customer and who you should be even selling to? Yeah. Yeah. So the first are important, but uh, how to, to sell these projects internally to these customers yeah i mean all of them you know ultimately i want all of them i want every single one of them uh you know i, I want everybody to name all of the cast of characters glenn can you hear us and he's like he's like i joined late <laughs> <laughs> i can't make it in hitting it. all right so so, let, so let's just talk about first, who are the decision makers on these projects, Troy? Well, uh, the way I look at it is, is most of these projects start from the technical side, right? So you'll have technical people reaching out to sales guys looking for product information. Mm -hmm. And important to know, these people are going back to the old 80s book, strategic selling. Most of these folks are what you call the technical buyers. These are guys who can say no to a technology, but they don't have the authority to say yes or sign anything. They're very important. They're basically gatekeepers for the decision makers. So it's important to know who you're selling to and who you're, who you're giving a dem your, your demo to. So these are important people to have on your side as coaches. They need to believe in your technology and believe what you're selling uh, in order to, to move forward, the, the sales process forward. The problem that I see a lot is many of these, I see a lot of software vendors, they spend too much time with the technical buyers and they try to sell them and, and this is their only contact they have in an organization. It's really a mistake because they can't say yes, they can't sign anything. So even though they're coaches, you want to have them at your at your at so, as Al. So they they only have the power to say no technically. Yeah, right, right. So the decision makers will ask these technical folks to come in and say, look, check out a technology, see if it's viable. If it is, we'll bring it in. If not, we will, we're going to pass on it. So it's initial power for these folks to say no, uh, yeah. but they can't sign anything. So it comes time to move forward and actually get uh, a signature on the PO. They can't do that. They have to give their thumbs up to the person who can. So it's, it's important to keep working through the process and not get caught dealing with the technical buyer. Have them remain the gatekeeper in these organizations. They enjoy the power. They love being the gatekeeper. But I see, I see too many companies spending too much time with these technical buyers and not moving mm -hmm. forward. And when they say, yeah, it looks good. We're going to move forward. We, we, want, we love the technology. They expect it to, to be sold. It's not. That's just the, <laughs> I see a cat. That's, That's the beginning cat. of the process. <clears throat> So, so when when we get to the executive, all right, mm. who is not the technical buyer, you know, who are the cast of characters in the executive suite? Well, I, I think when you first we have a new opportunity, it's important to understand what everybody's role is. Typically, it's 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 the business owner, and business has the bucks, right? Uh, IT yeah. has technology, but business has the bucks, and you want to always uncover what the pain is and who it's going to affect. I've been in demonstrations where you see some of the most incredible dashboards 
And on one side, you see the technical guys saying, wow, we can connect this and this is, this is great. And, and the business guys like, oh my God, this is eye candy, I love it, how do I get this? Two totally separate people who like, like the tool for different reasons. So it's yeah. important to go into it and, and, and understand the pain involved. So Rich, after the sale, so now now you're walking in first time, you know who are who are the who are the people that you're looking for in the room, um, you know, and what 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 are the uh, uh, what are the people that are going to stand in your way? What are some of the personalities that'll stand in the way of a data project moving forward? Well, there, you know, there's lots of personalities that you run into. What, the one that you really got to watch out for is the blocker, um, you know, and that's the uh, it's like I, I like to say, um, you know, the answer, we've always done it that way, is never the right answer. Even if it's the right way to do it, we've always done it that way is not the right answer. But you get some of these folks, and, and I see them almost every project, uh, you know, there's somebody there that it's like, why do we have to do this? You know, why, why, what we've got is working just fine. Why are we moving forward? You know, somebody from marketing or somebody from the business saw some fancy demo, saw some, you know, something in a magazine and, and we really don't need this. And so you've got to figure out who that person is right away, right? That's, that's the blocker. They're going to throw up yeah. stumbling blocks in your way every chance that they get. And so you've got to, you've got to be very um, aware of, of who that is, um, you know, or, or who they are uh, so that you can start working on them right away because you've got to, uh, if you can, if you do it right, you can turn them into some of the, that blocker can be turned into some of the biggest cheerleaders uh, and, and movers and shakers in the project that, that you would ever dream of having. So, so what, what are the, some of the tactics that you've used in the past to get that to happen? I mean, I'm sure every project man, technical project manager knows who their blockers are. You know, what are some of the things that got them to turn? I've used everything from, you know, physical beatings to uh, bribery, to be honest with you. <laughs> but, um, okay. you know, there's, there's, there's emotional attachment that we need to recognize with these things. And so somebody made a decision to move forward in a different direction years back, and they may still be emotionally attached to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, so there's a video, um, if you recall, the video that Lee Green recorded um, on our Intricity 101 channel. He talks about... Uh, these people that have spent oh, oh Glenn's there yeah there yeah Glenn, oh yay hooray Glenn's technical, back. technical difficulties I just realized uh, there's a little trick inside this program that if you start it with uh, your earpiece not engaged then it will never log you in all right well very it's, good it, well, it, it, there's just a little SQL command that you need to write. Yeah, exactly. Right. There's a little SQL yeah. command that I need to write. Yeah. You exactly. Have to write you got to explain to people what that's about. That it, we won't go into detail what the client was, but there was a really funny engagement where, you know, you have to understand that Glenn has been doing SQL, literally it's like 30 years of SQL, and he knows things about SQL that most experienced people in SQL just were like, wow, I didn't think of it even being able to do it that way. So we had a... a and this is a this is a great for the topic because we're talking about the cast of characters, Glenn. Like, who are the types of characters that you find during a project, and mm -hmm. and what are the roles that they play? Uh, there was a a particular character who we could tell was not watching the project. They weren't actually aware of what was going on in the project, um, and and the and he had assumed the role of an antagonist the, the for the entire thing and. So we're talking with him about the project and he says, well, Glenn doesn't even know SQL. And, and all of us are like, okay, now we really know how distant you are from this project. <laughs> so, so, so everybody a, has never let me live this down. Yeah, so, so everybody, everybody jokes around, you know, Glenn, Glenn's still learning SQL. We're still trying to teach it, teach it to him. So, oh. um, but, but in these- When we were talking about the blocker, uh, Jared had yeah. asked uh, when you get in to the project, you're starting the project, who mm -hmm. are some of the people that you need to be aware of? And, and one I brought up was was the blocker. Why are we doing this? We don't need to do this. Yep. What we're doing yep. is fine. They're going to throw stumbling blocks in your way every, every chance that they get. Um, and then Jared was asking, well, how do we, how do we deal with that person? How do we change the, the blocker? 
And I told him that it sometimes it takes physical beatings and, and sometimes it goes all the way to bribery, but there are lots of different ways. So that's where we but, were just to catch seriously, up. Seriously, like, what are some of the turning points you've seen? I mean, because you, you mentioned that some people can sometimes be that the, those people can all of a sudden be your, your, your hero in the project. Like, what's the turning point? Like, what happens? Is it just random in every project? One of the things that I've seen, I mean, you, and this is where we talked a little bit last time that, you know, there's art and there's science to this, right? And, and, and even though we're dealing with technology, we're also dealing with people too. So there's psychology, yeah. there's all these things that come into play. Um, and one of the things that I've found um, with, with these blockers and with anyone is that uh, a lot of it is they want to be recognized. They want mm -hmm. to be, you know, they, they need somebody to say, Hey, look, all the stuff that you, uh, have done it's it's wonderful you know mm -hmm. we see the value there and let's figure out how you can continue to add value as we move forward I mean one example uh, I'll never forget this uh, was working this was a number of years ago um, and it, it's kind of funny now to think back we you know we've got these you know cell phones that that track everywhere you go and everything you do uh, but a number of years ago I was working with a, an energy distribution company they're they're delivering propane um, mm -hmm. And we were very, very beginning of putting uh, systems, computer systems on the truck uh, so that that uh, we could uh, the driver didn't have to have a bunch of paper tickets of where he was going to go deliver propane that day. We could we could basically transmit the information and the driver would have right on there where he's to go next um, and he could actually print out an invoice. And so there were a bunch of things, but it was a brand new onboard truck computing system. And there was one driver that was the, the best driver that this company had. He'd been there for years and years and years. And his thing was, why do we need this technology? Why do we need this system? I know, I can tell you who needs propane. I can tell you when I need right. to go there. And and so he was, he was uh, you know, digging his, his feet in the ground and, and was not going to move forward with this. And I could see very, very quickly that he was going to poison the water with everyone. And so what I did was... I had a couple of folks there with me that were helping with the project. And I said, look, I need you guys to do some of these other things. I'm going to go spend a day out on the truck with this guy. So I actually went and jumped on that propane truck with him, spent a day out there going around doing the deliveries, talking to him, and then started to say, okay, let's, you know, take some of the information that you've got. How do we use your knowledge to make this system better so that, you know, we're, we don't, we know you know how to do this stuff. We know that you're amazing here. How do we use this, you, all of your knowledge to you, to build it into these systems so we can help these other younger drivers to be just as efficient as you are. And, and once he started to kind of see, wow, I've got a role here. I can, yeah, I can yeah. mentor some people. He, he turned out to be the greatest, uh, you know, the greatest cheerleader for that project. It was really a, a an eye opener for me. That, like I said, that happened a number of years ago in my career. But yeah, yeah you can't so, expect that someone. That was your uh, physical beating story, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. That's yeah. Well, I, I found. I mean, I, I've got a, a, another, you know, similar story. We, we were working for a pharmaceutical company, and 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 we were moving very fast and 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 rolling things out into production a lot faster than they were used to, and. Um, you know, as as things happen in organizations, somebody decided we wanted to create a very elaborate checklist to promote things into production, and and they were using us as kind of the guinea pig of what that would look like. And so it was a constant change of, here's how you want to, to present that, those. Is this the pharmaceutical client that said we don't roll things out to production, only you roll things to production? Yeah, yes, that was the one that said <laughs> nobody rolls things out. You're the only one that rolls things out. Um, but. Uh, you know the the DBA was being an an incredible blocker for us, and and we had some time constraints on things, and you know, and and every time we needed to put things into production, it was a fight. It was you know I don't have time. I'm not going to be able to get to this for days, and you know after a period of time, this became a real sore spot, and and it was really causing a lot of uh, anxiety for the team because we just get held up. And so I, I, you know, took a chance to sit down with her and I said, you know, tell me what creates frustration for you. And after three hours later, I've uh, got to know her family, her kids, her, her <laughs> everything. <laughs> she wanted to show me all these bad things that had happened in the past. And, 
and you know and i spent time commiserating with her uh asking her to tell me you know as you're preparing kind of these rollout documents you know what about this would make it easier for you how could we make our stuff easier for you so your time spent is is just for the things that you need to do and you're not spending time checking things that we could have already prepared for you so we spent time kind of rearranging how that rollout document should be done we we put some checklists in uh, in place to make it easier to pre-test things for her so that when she got it it was good to go we we came up with some strategies about doing uh, a dress rehearsal rollout so that they could pre-test it um, this is kind of before CICD had really entered into the data world. Um, but uh, in doing all that and, and you know, spending the time to listen to get to know her, all of a sudden she was our best ally. In fact, she would, she would you know, use her rage to throw people and say, go talk to Glenn because he'll tell you how to do this right because I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> so what you see, what I'm just noticing is that when people have a process in place and they've invested in it, and we're about to move their cheese, we're about to move things around, that whether it's because of pride, uh, pride of ownership of what they previously built, or whether it's just purely out of, you know, I don't even know who this person is, and he's ask, he's pushing me around, uh, asking me to do all this stuff that is, you know, additional things on my list, and I'm just gonna tell him to go pound sand. Um, it sounds like one of the key things is is this relationship of trust with these individuals. Um, and one of the things that Lee Green uh, said when he did his videos, he said, you can't expect these people to per, to per, to help you build a future that they're not in. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, so if they don't believe that they're in this future architecture, that their role uh, lives anywhere in this future architecture, then then they're not going to participate in it. They're not going to be interested in in helping you. Um, okay, so we talked about some of the the these people that are um, you know sort of standing in the way. I want to talk about project managers for a second. Um, <laughs> It's in the vein sometimes. Sometimes there's good project managers, there's bad ones. I want you to describe good project managers and bad ones, and and you know really what what where the line is. Again, and and Glenn, you weren't here when I said this. I want someone to be able to walk away from this this video cast, being able to say these are the traits I should be looking for uh, when I'm hiring for you know uh, uh, building a data uh, a data project. So get, let's talk. Let's talk project managers. Um, give me, give me. What are some of the traits that are, that you know are not favorable for project managers? Project managers that do good or bad. You want to start with the good ones? Do bad, or bad first, ones? and then we'll do good. Okay. So I think anybody that's worked on projects, uh, you know, of any size, the most frustrating thing is a project manager that does not understand what it is that we're doing, and to them they get a list of tasks that task a or task b there's no relevance of what is you know the level of complexity between one and another which ones you know may take longer time which ones are trivial and so to them all tasks have the same weight mm -hmm. and and you you get this process where their their job is to make sure we're making forward progress right but they can become the checklist you know box maniacs. checkers yeah and so they come and put stress on a team and, and want to check a box. And as we know in all projects, we, we sit down, we plan them, we design them, but they never are that linear. You know, things come along that we need to, to deal with. Sometimes, you know, we have to kind of change gears midstream to deal with a problem or to fix something or that we're, you know, being held up by uh, some other dependency and we, we move to another task. Project managers, that are not good project managers hate that. They want you to follow exactly what was dealt out. Yeah, yeah. They want to be able to check the box. Sometimes they'll come and put undue pressure on people to to agree that certain things will be done in when it's impossible. You know, there's nothing yeah, worse yeah. than you know telling a project manager, we're not gonna be able to get this done on, on the time you have slated there just because of this. And the project manager not accepting that and trying to to pressure them to agree to a a completion time that's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, there's this, 
Yeah, there's this mentality. I, I see it. I've seen it a lot, and I and I don't know how to put it perfectly in words, but uh, but it, but it triggers in my head. Like this is one of those people, and it and it's um, it's don't bother me with the details. Is it done or not? You know, it's yeah. it's kind of like in that in that vein, and um, uh, you know, of course, things have a a, a you know is it done or not? There is, there is that. Um, but you know, whether you added, uh, 70 pieces of scope in addition to what was asked is, you know, irrelevant to them. It's all, uh, you know, it's just, is it done or not? And a, a lot of times those, those folks, um, can have a very negative impact on the teams that they're, that, that are working with them. Um, in, in that, uh, they have no capacity to to actually see w what's actually happening in the project. They just they look at it at such a high level and they don't they avoid every possible detail of it. Um, that th those folks can be very very difficult. So on the on the good side of a project manager traits, you know, what are some of the things that 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 someone should be looking for if they're hiring a good project manager? You know, like one how, thing. That, go ahead. <laughs> to deal with all different personalities on a project, I think it's really yeah. important. You want you want a variety of personalities, right? So I want somebody who knows business, understands why you're doing what you're doing, and can also deal um, on, a, on a strategic level with the, with the members of the team. So it's hard to find that unique personality. So that, from an employer perspective, that's what I look for. It's what I want. Somebody who can be um, all things to all people. It's not easy to find. Uh, that's an ideal DM for me. Yeah, I mean, the psychological aspect of, because the thing with the PM is they are interacting with the business, like you said, Troy, and it's like everybody, you person, know, the yeah, all of the characters. Yeah. So, so to be well. able to to work with the politics of working with the business as well as working with the the team members. Um, what are some another, of the other traits? Another good trait is is you know obviously, and since we deal in technical projects. Uh, the project manager having enough technical background or expertise to be able to just know what's going on. You know, one of the yeah. things I think that drives everybody crazy about a project manager, is it done? Is it done? Is it done? Is Why is it not done? A good project manager, uh, and I, I had one that uh, that I worked with that was so good. I was just astounded. And, and what he did is he really was following what was really happening with everybody and he knew what was done and what wasn't done. He, I rarely had him come to us and say, is this done yet? He already knew. He was watching it. He yeah. was, you know, part of our, our meetings. He was part of some of our uh, development discussions. And, and he could, you know, because of his technical background, intuitively know this is done. This is going to be an issue. And he would, you know, come to us and say, I can see that you're, you're getting stuck here, you know, and, and we, our timeline was this. Let's talk about what we need to do to make some changes. And he was very proactive in understanding what was going on and not just coming back and say, when can I put the next check mark in? Mm -hmm. and, and say, I was done. And amazing. And, you know, I was just, it was, it was, you know, almost I didn't know what to think about it. It was like, well, this is the other aspect of project management, which is, you know, on a project, uh, sometimes, especially if there's new scope that's added and things like that. It's very easy for a project manager to just avoid elephants in the room, mm -hmm. you know, like new scope or, uh, hey, there's a delay in this specific scenario. Um, it's very easy because saying negative things, anything negative is seen as, you know, oh my gosh, you know, the sky is falling. If you, I don't know if you guys ever saw the, um, um, I don't recall the name the name of the the CFO or CEO of uh, Ford. He's no longer the C CEO. But remember when they had all the bailouts and the guy the the Ford CEO said, "Oh, I'm not going to take it." It was that CEO, and um, they were on a a meeting. Uh, and he had just been hired. Um, he, he'd probably been in the role for a few months, and uh, they're in this meeting, and all of the reports. Uh, they they had this report that would have the red light green light, you know, um, and it was all green light. Like it was constantly all green light. Everything was perfect, and uh, you know, after a few months of this, he he's like he's like guys, we're a company that is literally going bankrupt. You, you're telling me that we're all green light, like constantly all the time. This is just just baloney. 
He's like, we have to have a change in culture. And uh, it was in the next few meetings, there was a Japanese division that was having an issue. Um, and one of their guys, the, the guy that was running the Japan division, he, he brought it up, put it up as a red light. And that, that CEO, <laughs> that's all he did. He just clapped. He, he stood up and clapped. He says, I want everybody to clap. We have a red light. I'm so excited to do this. <laughs> How can we help him? You know, so I think that that's one of the traits that most project managers, and I think that has to do with the culture of the companies. Now, I, I could be wrong about that. I want to get you guys' opinion on that topic. But, you know, the companies themselves create this kind of stress. Does that does some of the stress that companies pr push down, and I know you guys have been on some that are related to this, but there's sometimes there's companies that are under financial stress. Yeah, uh, naturally, like their 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 market situation is not great. I'm thinking of one in particular, Glenn, that we didn't know it at the time, but they were about to get investigated by the SEC. Oh yeah, I know exactly what um, you're talking about. So we walked in, and it was just instant stress, like yeah. right out the, out of the gate. So can can you speak to that? How does it change the behavior of the people that are on the project? You know, what are some of the the signs that you saw there? Some of it was that um, a couple different things is is there was a lot of anxiety about getting done, but getting done in a way that would solve a problem that that wasn't initially explained to us uh, mm -hmm. about the data accuracy and, and whatnot. And so there was a lot of fights between our project and finance, who who was part of this. And you know when you and the project manager or or the it was a combination of the project manager and the kind of the project owner, um, it was just a, a constant battle. And and mm -hmm. and part of the problem was is anything that we did, good or bad, was bad. You know, <laughs> the, the, yeah, it, we it, we could have delivered gold on a platter, and you know it was uh, everything was a red light there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything was a red light. Everything and and it really created a lot of a lot of stress for the team because we're like, you know, this, you know, a team knows when they do good work and they know when they do bad work. And so when mm -hmm. you're delivering good work and it's quality and it's, you know, it's, it's timely and things like that, and you're still getting, you know, taken to the woodshed, you know, it does, you know, really demoralize uh, the team. And so you, you have to have people that can deal with bad news as a project manager. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. If, if they light their hair on fire every time something is bad, it will naturally force the team to not disclose the bad news until it's typically mm. at a at a boiling point, and right. then it really is a a fire drill. You you want to have project managers that are really receptive in a good way about mm -hmm. bad news because large complex projects are always going to have challenges. All of them, yeah. They just they they will. Uh, There's no, no magic button. Much, yeah, there is no magic. And so getting that bad news early, handling mm -hmm. it well, not trying to find scapegoats to drive the bus over. You know, there, there's been projects where I felt like I was a bus mechanic because I was always underneath it. Um, you know, <laughs> no matter what we did, I was, uh, you know, you know, checking the uh, transaxle of the bus as it passed over me. Um, and that, that does create a lot of uh, anxiety in, in a project. And one thing I'll also add, and this is the other, you know, you asked me about project managers and what's a good project manager and what can, can you know, cause problems. Oftentimes we see organizations um, take project manager um, approaches, methodologies, and make those a bigger focus than what they need to be driving uh, people that need to be doing the technical work and getting their work done spending an inordinate amount of time uh, playing, you know, project management games, you know, mm -hmm. hey, we want you to fill out this document every day and we want you to write up this little summary and we want you to do this and, and we're going to so agile technical work, you're doing their paperwork. Well, paperwork or sometimes, you know, agile can sometimes fall into this camp. You know, I've, I've worked with organizations that we literally spent 20% of our time doing the agile thing and there's mm -hmm. always a place for agile and and but it got to be where it was more about the ceremonies and the <laughs> and the and how we were doing it you lights know and I, candles. yeah it was it was lights and candles and 
you know, applauds <laughs> and, and, and voting and, and, and it became so much of, uh, of a time suck, yeah. you know, that, you know, we, and I say we were spending 20% of our time. We were, we literally every day burned up a couple hours in the morning and then some in the, in the end of day. And, you know, and I, I kept saying, what are we gaining from this? You know, mm -hmm. we know what we need to do. Let us do it. Um, and let's not have, you know, uh, kumbaya meetings <laughs> to prepare to do what we already know we need to do. Yeah. 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 I think that, that process, you know, a, a sort of a corporate sanctioned process can sometimes really get in the way of a process that they don't know anything about, which is turning data into information. Right. Um, and, and, and we have seen that that before in the past. I want to I want to put a point on the, that that story that I gave you about the uh, SEC investigation stuff that, that the company was going through, because we did produce that warehouse in record time. Uh, it was an accounting an based warehouse to the penny, accurate to the penny. That they had never been able to balance. And that yeah. was part of what happened, you know, uh, is that they couldn't. And that balance. finance team loves Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, they were so struggling to fun understand what had happened, why they were yeah. they weren't balancing, and you know, and you know, the, here's the funny story. Let me just tell you, don't ever do this. So <laughs> they weren't able to balance every month. And, and they were off a little bit here and a little bit there. And they had rolled out a new uh, a subsystem that was feeding their, their ERP and they could never get it to balance. And so somebody, I'm sure with good intentions, um, as, as if, it, if you're from an accounting group, you'll know that at the end of the month, we, you know, we have to close the books. And so oftentimes we'll make adjustments to make things balance, knowing that maybe we need to deal with them next month and things yeah. like that. And so they were having so much problems with this new subsystem that was feeding their ERP that they were constantly doing these, these, you know, adjustments, adjustments at the end. And so somebody with good intent and nobody ever owned up to who did it, wrote an app that would <laughs> look at all the accounts and just automatically balance them. Oh, oh man. Yeah. And, balancing and, entry here. <laughs> and so what happened, and this is why they couldn't find the problem is instead of doing a, a summary adjustment that you know is very clear, very visible. They were doing it at the transaction level and Thousands. doing some sub comparisons and saying, well, we know we're off here, so we'll just make an adjustment here. And they were doing it at such a low level, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these every month. And I'm sure somebody put it in place to maybe help smooth the process and maybe right. left it in place. But this went on for a couple of years. <laughs> and so you know, every month they would balance you know, end of month balance just like a like you know, <laughs> like perfect. Or just a well oiled would, machine. Yeah. Well, what would happen though is then they were back looking at books and they're going, why don't we match? Yeah. Why? Yeah, what yeah. is going on? And so that was when we were building this out. I started looking at all of these end of month transactions that were small. You know, they were ten dollars yeah. here, a hundred dollars here, and I'm like, are you doing like some? true up business at the end of the month that that doesn't get into the normal process what is this and they're like what are you talking about and i said at the end of the month literally right at the last day of the month you have like this true up process that is like you know and so i said i don't know if that's part of your business or they're like what are you talking about and i'm like let me show you these transactions let's show you the and data was, yeah and so i said let me you know data is a great thing it doesn't lie it, it doesn't have uh, emotions it's like spock and I said, yeah. let me just show you all this. And they're like, what is this? And, that, and so then we started digging and digging and digging and all of a sudden realized what was happening. And then we had to put a process in place to identify all that so that we then could, I, as we loaded it into the, the data warehouse, we actually out. flagged it. No, we flagged it. It had to stay there because, oh. you know, books are closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good point. You, even if you've automated your cooking of the books, um, <laughs> you still now have to... Uh, to, to disclose that so we we actually flagged those transactions and then it made it possible for the finance team as they went through their their review with the sec to identify what had happened how it had happened historically what it was yeah. and that the change had been put in place yeah i mean so and and those those are one of the the real things and i won't go too deep into this but one of the things that was cool about that project was that was really where we started playing with things like snowflake cloning 
you know, testing iterations in Snowflake. That was quite a while back, but it's it's really really interesting. Some of the things that we were able to uh, to pull off there. So, all right. So we talked about project managers. All right. I want to talk about um, one last thing, Jared, on project yeah. managers. If it could be a Slack message don't, or a Teams message, don't make it be a meeting, please. Don't make it yes. a meeting. Yeah. Yes. I, I have a little badge, a little award that I award myself every time I survive another meeting that should have been a Slack message. So. <laughs> yeah, and that is, that is so true. Yeah. One, yeah. Of the, one of the greatest challenges that a project has is keeping everybody informed. Yeah. And a project manager can fall into the pit of feeling like for their job to show success, they need to schedule meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings yep. and meetings and more meetings to share. You know, I, I've had cases where we've had a review at the end of the day, and the first meeting in the morning is another review of what we just had at the end of the yep. day. You know, yeah. and I see that happen all the time. I say, why? What? Is this meeting different than the one we just had, you know, at the end of the day? Or what, what are we gaining from this? The and, funny part is by having meetings. And yeah, that's, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah, and, so, and, uh, and all the things that go with yeah, meetings, meetings, right? It's, the right people in the meetings, the right number of people in the meetings, yeah, yeah. the right cadence for the meetings, all of those things. Yeah, uh, we, we had a meeting, or Katie and I had a meeting, and it had 30 executives in it. Just, just Arcadia and I were there, and I, I looked at Arcadia after the meeting. And I was like, Arcadia, that that meeting almost cost a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glenn I mean, and I sat through like, a number of those meetings. You know what I did one time though for a meeting, and this is when you back in the days you can actually see people face to face. Is have a meeting with no chairs, and watch yeah. how you're going to see a lot of the chit chat go away, and you go right right to the business. It does work. A meeting we, with no, oh, a standing, like a standing meeting? Around, stand around the table, have a meeting, but don't make people comfortable because people yeah. want to leave. Now you talk about the important things only when you do something like that. It does work. I, I, I had a large candy company we did work for and uh, they there was a group that did that. And so all the meetings were, we stood around a pillar that was just kind of in a common area. It was not comfortable at all. And, and man, those meetings just hummed, you it's know. All business. <laughs> Quick, but but you quick you make meetings. a point you make a point here and I, I will touch on this. One of the challenges that often happens in in big projects is there are lots of players that are part of the project. What what you want to avoid and a good project manager will be will hone in on this is who needs to be at the right meeting and don't bring people in just because you want to make them feel good. You know, I, I've watched people uh, spend 70% of their day attending meetings of which they say nothing. Well, yeah. here's a question for you, Glenn, right? Think about this. It's almost like, like, like shouting fire in a movie theater. Are you, how many auto meetings are you, are you, invites you sent like every week? Just how well, many do I send? Uh, are you, are sent to you? Oh, to me? Well, you know what my calendar looks like. <laughs> Well, yeah, and how many of those do you really attend? I mean, at the end of the day, you're like, okay, ignore this, ignore that, ignore that. And, and the whole idea is why are you being sent these messages? I right. Mean, well, a lot of times there's a, an assumption that if you don't invite somebody, then mm -hmm. they're going to have hurt feel bads. They're going to feel like they're being excluded. And a lot of people build that as part of how they feel like, you know, if I'm not in the meeting, then I'm not important. And, yeah. and so a good project manager will help uh, smooth over that that concept and and what I love is is when the people everybody that's in the meeting is a contributor you yes. know I hate yeah. going to meetings where you've got 20 people in the meeting but only three people are really doing anything yeah well, think, rest, how many meetings have you left saying well wh why was I invited to this meeting in the first yeah. one? oh well, feel good about it if you're included you're kind of like don't waste my time I'm too busy for this don't do it, it. Well, exactly. and then and then exactly. there's the and then there's people saying well you were in the meeting Oh, it's yeah. like, well, okay, like if, if it has nothing to do with me, it's, it's like a, you're supposed to be part of the Borg or something. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a, again, a good project manager knows their resources, knows the importance of the resources and their times, and will make sure that the right people are in the right meeting at the right time. And that's hard. Yeah. I mean, it really is. Um, so, and, and, so. is and they're not afraid to cancel meetings. You know, yeah. sometimes we put meetings on the books and we feel like, well, we've put that on the book, so we, we just have to have it. I can't yeah. tell you how many meetings I've got on and said, what's the purpose of this meeting? 
well, we bucked this three weeks ago thinking that we might need it. Okay, yeah. but do we need it? Because I don't think we need it. You know, and that's always kind of uncomfortable sometimes for, you know, for people that, you know, took the time to come to the meeting and then, hey, we don't need this meeting. Just a couple of weeks ago, speaking to a customer or a prospect, we couldn't find a time for everybody to meet. And they said, tell you what, let's get together Monday morning at nine and get together and figure out a time that works for everybody. I'm like, wait, we just had a, we had a meeting. This meeting to plan a meeting. There you go. <laughs> it's a meeting to plan a meeting. All right. So on the technical side, so now we're sort of. Or I I've kind of gone through the spectrum where we did project managers, which would be nice if they were technical, but sometimes they're not. When you start getting into the more technical resources, you know, what are some of the things that we're looking for there? I mean, I think, you know, oh, I can tell you immediately first on my list and, and it should when I die, I, if they don't put this on my gravestone, I'm going to beat my children. Um, <laughs> but uh, it should be. Because I've got a bunch of stuff to put on there myself. You've got stuff to put on there too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to have to have a really large one. <laughs> I can add some things too, Glenn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's going to be this, it's going to be like this little gravestone that rolls off onto the, onto the grass that has like a, like a scroll. Uh, my number one, and I, I've been preaching this for years. When I was CIO, I, I used to just literally say this 10,000 times a day. Um, and it was own it to done. Okay? okay, if you've been given something that's your responsibility um, and you have some stewardship on it, I don't care if there are other people that you have dependencies on. I don't care if there's something, a problem with it. You own it until it's done, period. And th that's the number one thing I look for in people is if you're given something, what drives me crazier more than anything else is you assign something to somebody and then you, you know, you follow up with them and you say, okay, where are we at with this? And this is the one that drives me nuts. Well, I, we tried to do this and we had a problem. And so we stopped. And, <laughs> and yeah. you go, and what did you do? Well, I we didn't know how Glenn to do it. last Monday, um, a, the question, and then a week and a half later, yeah, I, and then I didn't do any, we, we hear that all the time. Yeah. And yeah. we go, we go, guys, if you're stuck, hard. if you don't know what you're, the, the, being stuck is not a an okay to to just forget about it and and you know wait till somebody comes and asks you about it. Being stuck is is a telltale sign for you to say how do I get unstuck? Is it yeah. that I need to go research something? Is it that I need to go talk to somebody? Is it that I need to raise a red flag and say hey we have a problem? Um, but you know own it to done. That that should and it's be. Almost, this is almost the you know you need you need resources that in their own heads have a bit of a project manager to say, okay, yes. I'm stuck. I need to raise a flag. I need to do something about this uh, because it, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and one of the things I've noticed just in the hires that, that uh, over, over the years, people we've hired and things like that, the really, you know, and this is, this is a lot of uh, what Intricity staff is made up of is just people that really, care about what they are building like mm -hmm. they they have this like I, I can almost see it when when i see someone talk get, get really excited about presenting what they built you know they're kind of like like check this out like you, you gotta see what i just Real built nerdy. yeah they're like super oh, cool. excited you put on the refrigerator <laughs> That's right. i actually love that because it, it shows me exactly what i want to see it shows me somebody who yeah. it has this pride of ownership in the work that they're doing and they're they're super excited to share their work. Um, I love it when consultants come to me and and say, "Tell me about the customers' reactions to their work," because you can tell that that that's that's the drive. You know, that's what they they love seeing. You know, so that that's one thing I've looked for. You know, and I've seen it in in uh, you know in, in a lot of consultants, but but it's one of the main main things I'm looking for. I, and, and I'll tell you this, I do like consultants that are not afraid to ask questions. Yeah. Um, you, you get some consultants that are have a, a, a fear of asking questions because that may show that they don't know something. So I like consultants that, that, that like to ask questions, but I, I like them even better when they come and they say, here's what I tried to solve, and here's the things that I did, and, and here's everything I did, and I'm still running into a problem here. What, what am I missing? You know, because yeah. you do get some people that the second they get a barrier, it's question time, you know, yeah. throw this problem at your feet, you <laughs> yeah, know, hey, hey, Glenn, how do we do this? 
And I'm like, well, did you, you know, I've Have got this tried? great friend. His name's Google. He is awesome. He knows everything. <laughs> I need you to go consult with him before you come and just throw everything at my feet. Um, and so those are the things that we're lo always looking for is, what have you done to try to solve it on your own? Because I mean, at the end of the day, that's how we learn. You yeah. know, if you're given something challenging and then you you work to interpret and understand it, then you master the understanding. If if everything is just given to you freely, you never really learn how it works. So well, we're well, looking at that get, all the time. Isn't that then part of our the, process too? That some of the questions you ask people. If you run into problems, what do you do when you run into problems? I know you've asked that in interviews for people too. You yeah, know? all the time. I throw it out in interviews all the time. And like, let me give you a problem. What would you do? You know, tell me how you would solve this. What would be this the resources that you would use to to you know get things done? You know, I mentioned get, getting excited about your work. What's funny here is is that Rich Rich uh, does amazing work, and it's not until you poke him and say, "Well, show me what you did." I'm like, "Oh my gosh, why didn't I know about this? this is amazing!" And he's <laughs> like, like, "Yeah, well, I just did this." Humble's gonna gotta go away, Rich. <laughs> yeah, I'll lose that. So there's a there's a uh, a dashboard <clears throat> that Rich has built uh, with Glenn, and it's 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 kind of this collaborative thing, and it has to do with uh, Snowflake monitoring. And I and I I I'd seen screenshots of this. I've been looking at stuff, and I'm like I'm like this is cool, but I want to see it. So I finally got my hands on it. And I'm like holy cow! I mean this is very good. There's a lot here, you know, <laughs> and uh, and and Rich is so nonchalant about it. it's like yeah well you know i've been working on it so well I, no, I, well I get excited about this stuff ask my wife her eyes glaze over every night when i finally get upstairs and i start telling her all the cool stuff i'm like you would not believe it is so cool look at what do we do this? and she uh, eyes glaze over uh, yeah well we maybe, maybe back, it's while you're at work. our, our, our last week discussion is what is it that you do you know, because oh, yeah, yeah. we all have the same problem. We'll get excited about something, and I'll try to tell my family, and they're like, "What? what is it you do? There's yeah. clouds, and there's snowflakes, and there's, you know. <laughs> all right, so now there's another category, and this is, tech, this is a technical resource, but is very, very business savvy, and this is the data architect. Mm. So what are some of the traits in the data architect? Now, I'm just going to tell you my opinion. I've seen some data data architects that are real jerks. They they're so prideful sometimes. I don't know why this is, and maybe it's because they have a bridge between uh, business and technical, and they think that they're just the gift to the world. Um, but I have seen a, a lot of data architects that are just, uh, you know, they just feel like they're so special. And I, and so I'm just curious what you guys have experienced there, and when it comes to data architects, and what kind of traits we need to be looking for. It impacts everything. Yeah. This is the art here, so, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, one good thing is, is from a data architect and an or a solutions architect is, is experience. Now, no doubt, the, the experience is a, is a critical factor. There's nothing worse than an inexperienced architect trying to tell you what to do, and, they you know, they don't know which way's up. That's always yeah. frustrating. <laughs> But I would tell you, an architect needs to be a an information gatherer. You know, one thing that always irritates clients is if you come in and start mandating, you know, oh, you've done yeah. it wrong, you need to do it this way, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. What I always find is is you want you want somebody that can come in and absorb what is important to them, absorb yeah. what is in place today, where we want to go, and then be be thoughtful in how they architect mm -hmm. um, both from a what is reasonable what is doable what is within you know I see people come in and they start laying down architectures that is beyond the financial scope of the client you <laughs> got to have this you got to have that you got to have this new big widget here and and what ends up having is the client either can't fund it or they try to fund it and it, it gets halfway through a project and fails yeah, yeah. so an architect has to be they have to be the the, the consummate problem solver, um, and 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 look at what's reality, what's available, what can be done, what should be done, and then in the middle come up with an a, a doable architecture that everybody can buy into. That incorporates okay. the future too. Yes, that thinks yeah, futuristic, yeah. but again, within the reason of the uh, you know 
you know, the client you know oftentimes a, a client will say, well, can we do this? And I say, well, you could do this. I don't think financially you could cost justify it. There may be some other ways that we could do that that would be more within the, your 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 financial ability or technical yeah. ability. You know, you don't want to bring in a super complex solution that may be outside the needs of an organization. You know, not every organization is, is as, as mature and ready to to implement a lot of things that maybe a, a more mature or larger organization would be. So that balance is always important. The other side of a data architect is, well, go ahead, Rich, if you're going to. Oh, go, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the other side of a data architect that, <clears throat> and this is one of Arcady's unique traits, is is this person that can speak to business people. Yes. You know, he's very, very good at speaking to to business people. I'd love for him to join our our, our uh, podcast if he if he'd come every once in a while. Um, he gets on our books, but 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 the ability to connect with a a business person and not talk propeller head for mm -hmm. just a minute and focus oh, yeah. on what's the business problem. What are we trying to solve from a business perspective? Don't get so distracted by this. That don't try to sell technology to the situation first. Focus on what the business problem is and be able to speak directly to the business. And one of the oddities about Arcady is that he, you know, he got his degrees in accounting and yet he's this, you know, he's a, a technical guy. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's yeah. So being able to talk to a business to person. Don't worry about the plumbing. We'll take care of that. That's a whole different conversation. But where do you want to right. have work? Yeah, right. Well, yeah, you got you got to know who's driving, right? Who's who's in charge, and 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 understand the different players, the business, the technology. Really, you know, what is the the true role there? It's kind of I call it the battle battleship principle. So you mm -hmm. guys have have heard that story uh, real quickly. You know, there's a years ago there's a captain out on his battleship. It's a really really foggy night. He's cruising along and they see a light up ahead. And so he tells the signalman, signal to that ship up ahead to change their course 10 degrees to starboard. The signal comes back, says, change your course 10 degrees to port. The captain's now upset. He's like, I'm the captain. Tell them I'm the captain. You change your course 10 degrees to starboard. The signal comes back, change your course 10 degrees to port. So the captain said, fine. He said, send this. Tell them I'm on a battleship. Change your course 10 degrees to starboard. The signal comes back, says, I'm in a lighthouse. Change your course <laughs> 10 degrees to the port you know it's like you know you go into some of these businesses and some of these projects and you're like who's in the lighthouse and who's in the battleship you know yeah. a lot of times you get the people that are sitting in that battleship thinking that they're in the lighthouse um and they're not sure what's going on so you've got to right. have the people that really can understand that and make sure that you're doing the right things for the right reasons yeah um, you know so now, here here's one thing that i will tell you that if if i was writing a consulting book I, this would be one of the principles I would teach, and that is when you sit down, especially with the business, and are trying to gather business needs and trying to understand that, I will tell you the first thing that they tell you, set it aside. And, and people say, why? Why would you do that? And I say, because that's not their real need. Business, and it's, it's, it's a personal, it's how people do things. They'll tell you something that's important, but it's not this thing that if, boy, if we could fix that, it would be a yeah. game changer. And so you have to kind of be willing to have dialogues with the business to get through that kind of that first test, you know, because what the business is doing is testing the water to see, does this person really care, understand, is interested yeah, yeah. in solving it? And, you know, and I've sat with executives and, and doing strategy sessions, and, and I like to do that one-on-one. -on -one. I don't like to do it in a yeah, crowd. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I had I had a, a, a gentleman who was running a healthcare, a large, large healthcare organization, um, and was leader in in their state and and kind of a, a curmudgeon to to say the least. <laughs> and uh, everybody was so concerned about me having these one on one meetings, like you know he's gonna you know what are you gonna say to him and whatnot. And <laughs> and, and we spent the first and, and these weren't just a hour meeting. These were four hour sessions and they were yeah. so paranoid that this was going to be a, you know, a, a flame, you know, I want to ask you why that, why people get, why IT gets paranoid about meeting with the business, but, but fin finish but, this. So, and so, so that. quickly I sat down with them and what I did is I said, you know, obviously you know why we're here, but what I want to talk about is I want to talk about your business. I want to talk about how you manage your business what what are the things that work? What are the things that you're frustrated with that you are trying to get people to do, but they're just not doing it? 
you know? Yeah. And so we started going down this whole dialogue of what he knows will work, but we can't seem to translate from what I know will work to mm -hmm. it actually getting out to the field and then getting feedback from the field as to, as to what's working and not working. And that, you know, perpetuated into, you know, dialogues around, well, what is it that from an information point of view you don't have? And what is it, yeah. the information that you have that they don't have? And how do we present that to the different groups that are involved in a way that it can be, um, uh, when they see the information, it changes behavior? Mm -hmm. Or it, it, it asks the question, is our behavior being changed? And right. uh, after that first four hour session, you know, uh, you know, it was, you know, uh, how did it go? You know, <laughs> you know, they still want to keep us in here, you know, that type of thing. And it was funny because the uh, the the CEO came, uh, you know, back an hour later and because I, I was working just a few offices down from his and he came in, he says, you know, can we schedule like three or four more of those four hour <laughs> sessions? You know, he says, that was the most meaningful meeting I've had at this year. He says, you know, we have lots and lots of meetings, but nobody's asked me, how do I change the behavior? How do I provide yeah, yeah. information to change? And so, you know, that drove, a, a, you know, lots of great things with that organization. So in, what's in this fear? We... What, what, what are they, what is the, the technical team afraid of when it comes to talking to the business? Is it pride? Is it, you know, what, no, what's going on? No, no, I think more than anything else, it's translating technical stuff to business stuff and vice versa. And what the mm -hmm. reality is, is that there's a lot of technical stuff that the business doesn't care about. And I will take it and do it this way. When I go and buy my BMW X5, mm -hmm. I don't care how the, I actually do, but most people don't <laughs> care how the inline <laughs> diesel engine works. Um, they care that I put the key in the ignition, I push yeah. start, and it drives nicely and I, you know, it, it gets me from point A to point B. And oftentimes we come in and we want to explain to the business right. all of these very cool engineering things that have been done or we are, we are going to do. Right. And they are like, am Absolutely. I building this myself? Yeah. You know, is this a kit that I have to do on the weekends <laughs> or is this, <laughs> Are you going to build it? I'm confused at what, and, and, and at the end of the day, am I going to be able to get to the store? You know? Yeah. So again, it's, it's not talking technical to the business, but listening from the business. What is it that you need? And then being able to present, um, you know, if you will, ideas of if you could have this, the world of the possible, what would yeah. you do? What would you do with it? And that gets their mind flowing. And they say, well, if I had this, I would do this. And then, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the discussions flow. Well, that was a great uh, video cast, guys. Um, we'll hopefully have Arcadia on the next one. We, we had a, a rogue project manager that booked Arcadia's time right over this. <laughs> oh, listen, I had to undo like three meetings. Because I'm sorry. Of, um, and, and I'm, uh, I'm glad you did it because, and so was the audience. So, so thank you guys for, <laughs> for joining. We'll, uh, we'll catch you all next week and uh, we'll carry on from there. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Great weekend. Right. Catch you later. We'll see, see you. Yo.